Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God our Father, you will all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Send workers into your great harvest, that the gospel may be preached to every creature, and your church gathered together by the word of life and strengthened by the power of the sacraments, may advance in the way of salvation and love. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome to this conference, which is at St. Mary's, but not being hosted by St. Mary's. The Center for Evangelical Catholicism is a separate 501c3 entity that exists to promote the new evangelization in many ways, including conferences like this and others that T.J. Nielsen will explain to you. In addition to being pastor of St. Mary's, I'm the president of the Center for Evangelical Catholicism, and T.J. is our executive director. When we first started talking months ago about this conference, we focused on the idea of conversion. What is it? How does it happen? How does it grow in the lives of disciples? And we were fishing around for speakers to bring in from outside, and then T.J. happened on the happy thought that right here in Greenville, we have three priests who were all converts. Father Dwight Longenecker, Father Christopher Smith, and your obedient servant. And they both happened to be available to speak on conversion on the Feast of the Conversion of Matthew. So uh, it all came together very nicely. Uh, to explain more about the Center's work in future conferences and to introduce our first speaker, I now give you the Executive Director of the Center for Evangelical Catholicism, Timothy Nielsen. TJ? Good morning. I'm going to try to be super fast because we're trying to keep on a timeline because, as we all know, the real religion in South Carolina is college football. So that's why we're trying to be done by noon because, depending on your various team, there's good matchups. But restrooms are through those doors. For asking questions, we had it up here. I sent it in an email and then over there. But we're using the app Slido, which it's great. You can actually, I guess, text while someone's talking and not be rude. But um, so what it is, you write down your question in the app, but then it goes and you can actually vote on them too so that the questions people are most interested in hearing the answers to um, will keep going. And at the end of each talk, um, we'll archive them so that the fresh questions will come for the next talk. But during the little panel discussion we'll be doing at the end with all three priests, we'll bring back the other questions. So if your question didn't get asked at the end of a talk, that's okay. Um, there's still a chance it might come back. And so um, the Center for Evangelical Catholicism is a 501c3. We do most of our stuff here at St. Mary's because of the fact that I work at St. Mary's full-time as the Director of Christian Formation, and I am the Executive Director of the Center, and Father Newman is our President. Um, but we are, like I said, not specifically St. Mary's entity. What we are trying to do is spread the new evangelization in every way, shape, and form that we can. And so one of the things that we do is we started actually an upstate business leaders breakfast. So if you are a Catholic who owns your own business or um, an attorney or a financial manager, feel free to um, be in touch with me and I'd love to give you an invite to that. But then um, also one of the big things that we are trying to do is simply spread what's going on in Greenville. Because if you're not from Greenville or if you've been to Mass anywhere else in the rest of the country, Greenville's a special place where there are a lot of wonderful parishes. When you look at the fact that we invited three convert priests in Greenville who I think are three of the best Catholic speakers in the entire country, but when I was thinking about that afterwards, we could have invited multiple more convert priests in Greenville. When I started thinking of Father Jonathan Duncan, Father Rhett Williams over at, um, they all have in common that they are all converts. And so anyway, this is the amazing thing when you look at the 
the current moment in the church that where does reform happen? It happens in the parish. It happens on the local level. And so anyway, Greenville is one of the true sort of bright spots of what's going on in the Catholic Church. So anyway, go to our website, www.evangelicalcatholicism.com to find out more of what we're doing. Um, and I guess it's not up there anymore, so I was pointing behind me. But anyway, um, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker this morning, Father Dwight Longenecker. That Father Longenecker was brought up as an evangelical in Pennsylvania, but then he attended college in Greenville at Bob Jones University, where he got a degree in speech and English, and then he went on to study theology at Oxford University, and where he was eventually ordained an Anglican priest. And he lived in England for many years, where he worked as a curate, as a school chaplain in Cambridge, and then as a country parson on the Isle of Wight. And after, I'm not going to get too much in his story, because he'll be talking this himself, and after um, a while he realized that him and the Anglican Church were on divergent paths, and so in 1995, Father Longnecker and his family were received into the Catholic Church. Father Longenecker spent the next 10 years working as a Catholic write, freelance writer, contributing to over 25 magazines, papers, and journals in Britain, Ireland, and the United States. And he's also written 15 books and booklets on the Catholic Church. In 2006, Father Longenecker accepted a post as chaplain of St. Joseph's High School here in Greenville, which brought him back to the upstate. And also, in 2006, in December, he was ordained as a Catholic priest under the special provision for married former Anglican clergy. And this is before the ordinaria even existed. Um, and he was ordained here at St. Mary's. Um, and now he serves as the pastor of Our Lady of the Rosary on Augusta, which if you, if you have not been over to see their beautiful new church, you need to do so. It is gorgeous. And anyway, Father Longenecker enjoys movies, blogging. His blog, Standing on My Head, is one of the most popular blogs in the Catholic Church and also worth checking out. And him and his wife, Allison, have four children, two Labradors, and a bunch of other pets. And we're very fortunate to have with us this morning, Father Dwight Longenecker. Thank you very much. It's wonderful always to come back to St. Mary's uh, and to be uh, part of your parish here and part of this work of evangelical Catholicism. I'm very much aware, uh, as TJ has mentioned, of being one of the few married Catholic priests in the Catholic Church. And um, <clears throat> we actually have three of the married Catholic priests here in Greenville with the ordination recently of Father Richard Ballard, a former Lutheran pastor, uh, who is also uh, serving here in Greenville. And Bishop Guglielmoni, <clears throat> as this was moving forward, said there were some reservations expressed in the diocese that were getting too many married priests. And so I advised him and said, tell the dissenters that we are indeed dangerous, <laughs> but that you're trying to contain all of us in Greenville. So, so I would like to take the opportunity of thanking all the Catholics in Greenville for the warm welcome we have received um, and invite you to join our dangerous cause. And some people have asked, well, what is it like to be a married Catholic priest? And my short answer is always to say that soon after I was ordained, the National Catholic Register interviewed me about this new life. And the headline writer uh, was probably very busy that day because the headline is somewhat ambiguous. Anyway, uh, Mrs. Longenecker has clipped it out, laminated it, and put it on our fridge. And it says, married priests favor celibacy from personal experience. <laughs> that, that's her joke, not mine. 
I would like to share uh, my conversion story with you today from a personal point of view. The talk I have prepared is not uh, particularly replete with theological footnotes and references uh, because it's a personal story. However, I am sharing this with you uh, with the uh, particular intent of also sharing with you um, those good things from my Protestant background, uh, which I believe prepared me to come into full communion with the Catholic Church. And these attributes are also things which I believe are intrinsically part of our Catholic faith. I learned them uh, from the Protestants, and there are things which I value and treasure, therefore, from my background. And I have no time for the sort of Catholics who are constantly talking down about the Protestants. Uh, we all do that from time to time because it's fun, but it doesn't get us anywhere. And indeed, the statistics show us that um, here in the United States, and especially in Latin America, huge numbers of Catholics are leaving the Catholic Church to join various Protestant sects. And it's easy to, to dismiss them and say things like, well, the Catholics who leave are always leaving for something less, but the Protestants who become Catholics are always coming for something more. Yes, that's understandable, uh, but we have to ask ourselves some hard questions as well. Why are so many thousands leaving the Catholic Church to go to the Protestant sect? What is it that they have which our brothers and sisters are not finding in the Catholic faith. I believe everything they're looking for can certainly be found within the Catholic faith, but they're not finding it. And for whatever reason, it's not being delivered. So perhaps my talk today will help us to understand and reflect on some of the strengths and some of the good things that I learned in my Protestant upbringing and ancestry and that we might also take those on board and meditate and reflect on how it affects our Catholicism today and why the Center for Evangelical Catholicism is important. So uh, I will be talking about 15 different attributes uh, and I will be breaking it down into different sections of my story coming into full communion with the Catholic Church. To do this, I would like to go back to the very beginning. I'm a great fan of the poet T.S. Eliot, especially of his four quartets. And in the second of those four poems, East Coker, he begins with the words, in my end is my beginning, uh, and in my beginning is my end. In my end is my beginning was the motto of Mary, Queen of Scots, the one who was beheaded by Elizabeth I. And uh, he, Eliot, turns this around and he says, not in my end is my beginning, but in my beginning is my end. And he's simply making the point that all of us are the product, not only of our upbringing and our education, but we're also the product of a great long chain of ancestry that goes back through the generations. And we are the product of that, whether we know it or not, or are conscious of it or not. And so the ancestry that I trace my history back to, and I do this uh, proudly, is that of the Mennonites. Longenecker is a Pennsylvania Dutch name, and my ancestors came to Pennsylvania, William Penn's colony, uh, in the 1770s. Uh, if you see anybody with the name Longenecker in North America, he's some sort of cousin of mine because we're all descended from the same family, Ulrich Longenecker and his three sons, uh, who sailed on the ship, I believe, called New Freedom, uh, and came to the U.S. in the 1770s, to William Penn's colony, which was famous for religious freedom. The Mennonites were an Anabaptist sect founded in Switzerland, and which also took root uh, in the Netherlands. It took root in the Netherlands because the Swiss were persecuting the Mennonites and the Amish. In other words, they were such extreme Protestants that they were being persecuted by Calvin. If you can let that sink in. 
They fled to the Netherlands where they got established uh, and they were also uh, continued to be established in Switzerland. But their uh, persecution there by the establishment, uh, the Protestant establishment continued so that even by the end of the 18th century, uh, many of them were emigrating to find religious freedom in the new world. They settled in Pennsylvania along with the Amish uh, and established their little colonies and their communities there. So while I was never a Mennonite, my grandfather was brought up on a Mennonite farm in Pennsylvania. And so the Mennonite uh, memory is very strong still in our family. In fact, when I went to a Hutterite community, visited a Hutterite community in England, when I lived over there, uh, they said they saw my name, and I was by then an Anglican priest, and they saw my name and said, Longenecker's a Mennonite name. What are you doing being an Anglican priest? <laughs> and so um, the Longenecker clan is, has got Mennonite roots. And while I was never a Mennonite, what did I learn from that Mennonite spirit which is still there? Three things, and this begins the list of 15. The first thing is uh, a pilgrim spirit, a pilgrim spirit. The idea and the feeling very deeply in our hearts that this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. I will not put my tent stakes too deep. I'm going to sit lightly to the authorities of this world and I'm going to get up and go if I need to get up and go. And this pilgrim spirit, of course, is there right in the New Testament. We're a pilgrim people. Uh, we are called to move on. The Lord is always out in front, leading us somewhere else. So that pilgrim spirit, the spirit of hearing God's call and responding by getting up and going to another country, as it were, uh, is deep uh, in our ancestry and part of our Mennonite spirit. So that's the first thing is this pilgrim spirit. The second thing, which I think has uh, filtered down to me from the Mennonite spirit, is simplicity, apostolic simplicity, striving for uh, a simple way of life, striving for the proper relationship with material goods, trying to understand what they're really for, and to live a life that is simple. Not a life necessarily of apostolic poverty, we're not called to that, but a life which values material things for their true purpose and for their true worth. The Mennonites uh, and the Amish, of course, have another nickname. They're called the Plain People. The Plain People. Because their lives, if you visit in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and elsewhere where their communities still exist, you find that they have an abundant life, a life that is prosperous, and a life that is also sometimes wealthy, but they live that life in simplicity. You probably have heard the story about the Amish farmer who went to buy a farm for his son. So he loaded up the wagon uh, with a milk can, one of those big milk cans full of cash. And he went to the person selling the farm and the farm was selling for, let's say, half a million dollars. So he got to the farm and he dumped out the milk can and they counted up all the cash, $100 bills, $20 bills, and the amount only came up to $450,000. So he turned to his wife and said, Mother, we must have brought the wrong milk can. <laughs> so despite the wealth they might have, they live a life that is simple a life that is striving to uh, value things for their own worth. The third aspect of the Mennonite lifestyle uh, is the principle of subsidiarity, that what is local is best, that the solutions to problems and the initiatives to be taken are best taken at the local level. The local level being the family, the local church, the parish, the local community, that solutions are best found and initiatives best taken at the local level. The Amish and the Mennonite have strong local communities. They distrust large bureaucratic solutions. And that simplicity and lo local uh, emphasis is very strong. 
And some these are things which I recognize that I have inherited. And those first three are therefore the pilgrim spirit, a spirit of simplicity, apostolic simplicity, loving things for their own worth. And the third thing, subsidiarity, that people are best empowered to do their very best at the local level. The top-down solutions by big government and big diocese and big church and big organizations are not the answer. So this is the first chapter of four different segments which I would like to share with you. The Mennonite background, the Mennonite ancestry. The second aspect that I would like to share is my personal evangelical home. My parents were not Mennonite. Uh, we were brought up in a little evangelical independent Bible church in Pennsylvania. The pastor was a Bob Jones graduate, and this little church was founded in the early 1960s by a group of lay people who were disenchanted with the mainstream Protestant denominations and in true sort of American entrepreneurial style said, we can do church better than them. How hard can it be? So they just got together and started their own church. This little church uh, was where we were brought up. My dad was a deacon and a Sunday school teacher. We went to church morning, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And if anybody in, complains about Catholic homilies, the length of Catholic homilies, I say, hey, I grew up going to church three times a week and the sermons were 45 minutes. And if they weren't, the people complained to the pastor because they weren't getting their money's worth. <laughs> and so this was the sort of um, strong Christian evangelical home in which I was brought up. And I have four things that I would like to share with you that I remember from that upbringing, things which are precious to me and valuable, therefore, for all of us looking at the bigger picture. The first of these is an emphasis on personal conversion. An emphasis on personal conversion. This is number four on my list. And of course, the evangelical strength is that they call each individual to have a personal relationship with Jesus. You've heard your evangelical friends and family say that. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Have you accepted Jesus into your heart? Have you been saved? And so forth. All this sort of language uh, is the language of personal conversion, which is one of the strengths of the evangelical movement. We heard this morning the story. This is totally integrated with the gospel. We heard it this morning in the story of the conversion of St. Matthew. We hear it there in the calling of all of the apostles and all through the New Testament, where individuals are called and pointed out and said, Jesus says, I want you to follow me, and will you respond? Some time ago, I guess two summers ago now, I was coming down Highway 85 from Charlotte, and the northbound side of the highway was closed. And I saw as I came south, on all of the bridges, there were emergency vehicles with their lights going, fire trucks, tow trucks, ambulances, police cars. But what's going on? Came down a little bit further, and then I saw that there were people lining the north side of the highway. And then I came a little bit further, and the motorcycle outriders came on. It was Billy Graham's cortege. They were taking his body up to Washington to Lyon State. So I went home and thought, wow, I got onto YouTube and watched one of Billy, Billy Graham's old rallies. And there he was in Chicago in, I guess, the mid-1970s. Tens of thousands of people. And he preached a simple gospel message. And you know what he said? I want you to get up out of your seats and come forward. And they did. They did. As you know, thousands and thousands, because a personal appeal of conversion was made. And that personal appeal is something that we should not be ashamed of, because it goes right back to our Lord Jesus Christ, who spotted individuals and said, you, follow me. And as Catholics, we sometimes sniff at this and say, oh, yes, but they haven't been, uh, you know, they haven't been brought into the church. Well, that, that comes in time. 
But that personal conversion, which I experienced, is very powerful. What was my personal conversion? You know, I take a little bit of delight that if an evangelical Christian speaks to me and says, yes, but have you been saved? And I say, yeah, let me tell you about that. <laughs> because I was five years old and came home from church one Sunday night and said to my mother that I wanted to go to heaven with the rest of the family and not be left behind. And we knelt down and uh, she led me in a simple prayer uh, to become a Christian. And some people say, how terrible to frighten a five-year-old with hell. And I always say, well, I'd rather be scared into heaven than soothed into hell. <laughs> and of course, that five-year-old decision, decision of a five-year-old, was the seed of a real personal conversion. So this is the thing which uh, we gain from the evangelical. I gain from the evangelical hope. The importance of <clears throat> a personal commitment. That Jesus Christ really can call individuals and say, I want you to follow me. And that that conversion can be and will be, if it's sincere, life-changing. The fifth thing on my list, and the second thing from my evangelical home, is a missionary spirit. A missionary spirit. Along with the pilgrim spirit of getting up and going where we need to go, was also a missionary spirit. We uh, understood that the heroes of our faith were the missionaries, men and women, uh, who uh, heard God's call, and went to the uttermost parts of the earth, as the King James Version says, to share the gospel with other people. Not to bully them into the church or scare them into the church, but to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And that really, all of us were called to do that. I can remember going shopping with my mother to the farmer's market. And she'd stop at the bakery stall and order five bear claws and sticky buns. And then say to the person behind the stall, have you ever met the Lord Jesus as your Savior? And I'm 12 years old and going. <laughs> but that missionary spirit is the, the next thing from our evangelical home, which we understood was part of the call. And it was something that everybody was meant to be involved in. That missionary spirit was something that I took to heart as well. When I was here at college, uh, I was a member of Holy Trinity Anglican Church, the little st uh, stone church just stone's throw from here, the one with the red doors just down here. And we would go there um, for Evensong on Sunday nights. And it was there that I heard the call uh, to actually respond to be a priest. I had by this time decided, I was an English and speech major, I had this time, by this time decided in my junior year in college that I would be uh, an English professor at one of these brick universities with ivy growing up the walls and I would ride around on a bike with smoking a pipe with a tweed jacket and <laughs> a pile of books under my arm and how I was going to smoke a pipe and have books under my arm and ride a bike at the same time. I, <laughs> I hadn't quite worked out. And I would be an Episcopal or Anglican priest part-time. And it was there that uh, on one spring evening, uh, the prayer I can still remember at Evensong was that we might serve the Lord in beauty, simplicity, and singleness of mind. And the Holy Spirit took that phrase, singleness of mind, and gave it to me. And I decided that, therefore, I was to be a priest. At that point, an Anglican priest, never envisioning that some 30 years later, I would be ordained as a Catholic priest a short distance away here at St. Mary's. So the missionary spirit is part of uh, what I received from the evangelical home. The third thing, and the sixth on the list, is the love of sacred scripture. The love of sacred scripture. You know, of course, the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura, only scripture. And while, of course, uh, I have moved on from that, it is certainly that love of scripture, a genuine love of scripture, an appreciation for sacred scripture, which is a great treasure from my upbringing. We had to memorize Bible verses from the King James Version, and I can still quote them today. 
And that love of scripture and appreciation for scripture is something which has been with me for the rest of my life and something which is a great treasure from that evangelical upbringing. Do I now agree with all the interpretations of Scripture? Of course not. Uh, again, we've added to that and moved on from that. But that core of a love of Scripture is very important. And it's something which I have to admit, uh, very often our Catholics are sadly ignorant of. I feel sometimes like a lot of Catholics think the book of Philippians was written to the Catholics in the Philippines. <laughs> And this love of scripture is something that we really need to treasure and something I bring with me from that evangelical upbringing. The seventh thing on my list uh, is uh, uh, an understanding of the faith as being supernatural. That religion is the all about the interaction between God and mankind and that therefore it is by its definition a supernatural phenomenon. That religion is about the supernatural. Any religion, paganism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, that religion is about the supernatural. And if it's not about that, it ain't religion. It's the Girl Scouts or something else. Uh, but it's not religion. I'll share with you a short story about this which impressed it upon my heart. But we lived in an evangelical atmosphere in which we believed that miracles were possible. We believed that God answered prayer. We believed that God was involved with our lives. We believed that he would provide for us if we walked by faith, not by sight. And we saw it in real life. We heard stories of miracles. My parents, for instance, and I'll share this very briefly, were coming back one night from the youth group which they ran when the three of us, three of the five children were, were just little. I was probably only about two years old. We were asleep in the back of the station wagon car and my parents were coming down a country lane in Pennsylvania with steep banks on either side and hedgerows. And they said they came over the brow of a hill in this single lane road and they saw another car coming in the opposite direction at high speed. And my dad said, we knew that when we went down into the next valley, they would not be able to see us. And there was no place to go. And they continued on, and the car came hurtling towards them. And my mom said, we could see in the headlights the terrified uh, face of the other driver, because he also realized we were going to have a devastating head-on collision. And my mom said she could send up a quick prayer, Lord Jesus, help. And the next thing they knew, they were looking in behind the car and the taillights of the other car were receding in the other direction. Something had happened. Did the two cars supernaturally pass through each other? We don't know. But we know that our lives were spared. And we, my parents told this story with a very down-to-earth, matter-of-fact way. And shrugged their shoulders. Praise the Lord because they believed that religion was about the supernatural and that God was involved in our lives. The next section that I would like to share of things I got from my upbringing and I hope brought with me come from the time at Bob Jones. I was there for four years and the spirit of our evangelical home was quite peaceful, not particularly anti-Catholic. We thought Catholics needed to get saved, but that was, we weren't anti-Catholic. At Bob Jones, the mood was different. And so the eighth thing, uh, which I got from Bob Jones, was actually, ironically, an appreciation for a fighting spirit. I didn't agree with Dr. Bob's targets, but at least he had backbone. He had character. And he stood up for the faith, and he defended the faith as he understood it. And I began to realize that a fighting spirit was important. The ninth thing on the list from Bob Jones' times was an appreciation of beauty and the arts. As you know, Bob Jones has a, a stunning art gallery. Uh, and the plans are to move it, by the way, downtown here. And that uh, also they have a wonderful fine arts program with music and opera and so forth. An appreciation that arts actually uh, were a contributing factor to our faith and fit in with our faith. The tenth thing on the list 
uh, from Bob Jones was also to develop a spirit of skepticism. That's all right to be critical. By the time I had graduated, I had become quite critical of the fundamentalist evangelical world and the fundamentalist evangelical message. I'd become an Anglican and was moving in that direction. And I realized, looking back on it, that it's actually a good thing to be able to be critical, properly critical, and skeptical, properly skeptical, to be able to analyze and to be able to sift and to be able to think through what you're being taught. So from Bob Jones, therefore, a fighting spirit, an appreciation of the integration of beauty and the fine arts uh, with our faith, and an appreciation of skepticism, proper skepticism and crit a critical spirit. Finally, then, is uh, my time as an Anglican. I became an Anglican here. I went to study in Oxford, became an Anglican priest, and served in the Anglican Church uh, as a layman and then as a priest for 15 years in England, in the Church of England. From that, I appreciated and took with me a love for the historic faith. You know, in America, everything's new. In England, everything's old. And so I, was, and I appreciated the uh, beautiful medieval churches and cathedrals, the tradition and the history in the Anglican Church, which is a very precious heritage. And as I then traveled in Europe, I began also to understand and appreciate the deeper history behind and, and before the Anglican Church of, of course, the Catholic Church, and began to be open more and more to a historic faith, one that's rooted not just in the last 500 years since the Protestant Reformation, but also back to the other 1,500 years, right back to the Apostolic Age. And therefore, from Anglicanism, I learned to appreciate this historic aspect to our faith. The twelfth thing, also from Anglicanism and studies of theology, was to be able to appreciate uh, an intelligent and a reasoned theological approach to our faith. Sometimes in evangelical fundamentalism, there was a glorification of ignorance. It was considered to be a, a mark of uh, prestige uh, that you were not one of them intellectuals and you hadn't been to college. There's a value to the common man, but at uh, Oxford, of course, I was able to appreciate a more intellectual approach to the faith, a theological understanding of the faith, that the faith could actually be and should be reasonable and explicable to others. The thirteenth thing on the list, also from Anglicanism, was a proper appreciation of liturgy and literature. Of liturgy and literature. Of course, the Anglicans have the beautiful heritage of the 17th century language from the Book of Common Prayer. And when that held hands with the King James Version, uh, the heights and the beauties of in our English language were expressed in, lit in, in the liturgical worship. And therefore, an understanding of the importance of beauty in liturgy, the importance of language in liturgy, the importance of gesture and symbolism and proper ritual in liturgy and in literature. And these gifts from the Anglican Church have carried over into my understanding of the Catholic faith. An understanding that through literature and liturgy, we tap into the deepest parts of human nature. The parts that I say are sublinguistic, the stuff that's way down deep. And through literature and liturgy, we connect with the deepest parts of our human nature and therefore conversion gets way down deep into our lives. And this is a gift which I received through my time in Anglicanism. There are two more. We're almost to the end of the list. The 14th thing, again, which I uh, gathered from Anglicanism, was appreciation, a deeper appreciation of spirituality, especially monastic spirituality. I had been introduced to the Benedictine way by a friend visited Benedictine monasteries, and was very much drawn into a deeper understanding of prayer, meditation, contemplation, and spirituality within the monastic tradition. And finding within that monastic tradition a way of life, and a way of prayer, and a way of uh, living the gospel, which was deeply rooted in history, but was very available and accessible to all. The last thing is that I gathered from the Anglican Church was actually 
an introduction to our Blessed Mother. The Anglican Church, at its higher end, is very Catholic in its understanding of sacraments and doctrine and devotion. And one of those devotions is the devotion to uh, Our Lady of Walsingham. Our Lady of Walsingham. Walsingham was the great medieval shrine to the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the Middle Ages, it was, it was the Fatima and the Lords of its day. And Our Lady of Walsingham, therefore, was an introduction to the love and the life and the ministry of the Blessed Mother in my life. So all of these things together prepared the way and helped me into my understanding of the Catholic faith. One of the books that I've written is actually called More Christianity uh, because I'm saying C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity is all well and good, but the Catholic faith is more, not less. And one wants to gather up all of these riches from the Protestant tradition in all its different ways and say, I have found those to be fulfilled and completed most fully in the Catholic faith. Sadly, a good number of the things on my list are downplayed in our Catholic faith or ignored by many Catholics or misunderstood by many Catholics or even dismissed and despised by some Catholics. And therefore, I would say that we need to pull all these things together for our Catholic Church itself to be as rich and full and complete as it can be. That these strengths from the Protestant traditions are actually our strengths too. And the more we embrace them in the proper way, in the fullness of our Catholic faith, the more we will be enriched and also our evangelical brothers and sisters will be enriched. I have a special devotion to St. Therese of Lisieux, and there's a story about her at Christmas being presented with a basket of sweets and gifts. And her sisters say, which will you have? And she grabs the basket and says, I will have all. <laughs> and that's how I feel about our faith. Which of these things which I've th put into this basket would be attractive? And I want to say, I would have all. And that's why I believe our Catholic Church today needs to face the basic clash that exists. And it's a clash which exists between those who believe that the faith is all of these things that I've said and more, or those who believe that the faith is simply a way to accomplish a political agenda in the world. Those who believe that it is not actually supernatural, but instead it's a self-help organization which can make the world a better place and make people nicer people. And I reject that and say instead, our faith is a faith which has a pilgrim spirit. It has simplicity of life. It has an emphasis on the local and the subsidiarity. It should stress personal conversion, a missionary spirit, a love for the sacred scriptures, a wholehearted belief in the supernatural aspect that God is at work in the world. That it includes a fighting spirit an appreciation of beauty and the arts, it has a properly skeptical attitude towards the things which are opposed to the faith. It has a deep love and a rootedness in, in the history of our faith. It's reasonable and intelligible. It has beautiful literature and liturgy. It has a deep strain of spirituality and the love for the Blessed Mother. If you want to submit a question, use the app Slido, which you can download on your iPad, iPhone, or if you're one of those sickos with an Android phone, you can use that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get paid by that. <laughs> Father, if it's possible to approach full communion with the church, it's also possible to depart from full communion with the church. It's a two-way street. The first question is about traffic in the other direction. Shouldn't priests like Father James Martin and others who mislead the faithful and teach false doctrine be booted out or nudged along the road to get out if, in fact, what they're teaching is not the authentic faith? Yes, it's a good question. Um, I think really <clears throat> each one of us in this campaign must do what they can with what they have where they are. 
Um, it's not my position to discipline Father James Martin. Th that is the, he's a religious, therefore it should fall, his correction, formal correction, should fall to his Jesuit superiors. Unfortunately, his Jesuit superiors seem to agree with him uh, and they support him and condone him. Furthermore, there are other uh, members of the hierarchy who seem to be doing the same thing. What can you do and what can I do? Well, on my blog from time to time, there is an article which says, correcting Father Martin. <laughs> or, correcting Father Martin again. <laughs> or, correcting Father Martin yet again. <laughs> and so, with what power I have, what limited power that is through my writing, I attempt to do this in a public way and just correct the false teaching that he's promoting. But in fact, um, I agree with the questioner that something needs to be done, but it's beyond my power to do so and our power to do so. It, it falls to his superiors. It's worth noting that Father Martin gave a speech in Philadelphia several days ago, in response to which Charles Chaput, the Archbishop of Philadelphia, published a newspaper column correcting Father Martin's errors and warning people not to be misled. And as soon as Archbishop Chaput published his statement, several other bishops around the country, uh, on social media or through their diocesan communications offices, expressed their support of Archbishop Chaput. Now the sad news is, Chaput turns 75 next week, which means he has to offer his retirement to the Holy Father, and we'll get a new Archbishop of Philadelphia. Let's hope it's not Father James Martin. <laughs> The, the other thing about Father Martin is that he actually, his teaching is always very, very ambiguous and he always treads a very fine line. He never actually explicitly, openly contradicts church teaching. And that's why I've given him a nickname on my blog, Slippery Jim. Uh, when we read church history, you find that this has always been a tension within the church. Um, one of the reasons I recorded a 23-part podcast, which is available on my blog, called Triumphs and Tragedies, was to try to help Catholics understand the overview of Catholic history and to be able to see that a lot of the problems that we're facing in the church today are nothing new. Uh, and there's been a constant tension between the, world's, the church's relationship with the world uh, and uh, how, we, how the church actually responds. Do we conform to the world in order to reach the world with the gospel, or are we always challenging the world um, with the gospel? And it's a tension which is always there, and I, I don't have any easy answer because um, it's actually a, a tension which um, in the long run will be creative, but in the short run very often does a lot of damage. Last question in two parts uh, to your personal story. How did your parents react First of all, my parents were actually um, very uh, open-minded and very uh, loving and accepting. My mom is still living, um, and she lives over in Taylor. She's uh, one of Father Smith's parishioners. <laughs> Geographically. She actually goes to Mitchell Road Presbyterian Church, but, um, <laughs> but their, view, their view has always been, uh, when I went to England, for instance, and said I was going to be an Anglican priest, they sort of said, we don't know, understand where the Holy Spirit is leading you, but we trust you, and we trust your judgment. Um, my mom came to my ordination here, and she now has seen that her four surviving children and their spouses are all Catholic. Um, and she would say, I... I don't agree with you, what you believe, but I, I know, I'm glad that you're serving the Lord. Um, and so she's been very open in a, a genuine open spirit. And when she asks questions about the Catholic faith, um, and I attempt to answer them for her, she usually says, well, I never saw it that way before. And so she's, she's very open-minded about the whole thing. Uh, the second answer is very short, no. <laughs> Every Sunday, 
today must celebrate one Mass not for a specific intention, but pro populo, for the people. This is required by the law of the church. The people being described in that phrase are not those at Mass, not those registered in the parish, not those who identify as Catholic and who live within the parish boundaries. Pro populo means for every single person who lives within the boundaries of the parish. It's a manifestation of the church's understanding that she is the mother of the whole human race and responsible for praying for all to come to know the truth and be saved. We will now take a five minute break. Let's try to keep it to 10 minutes. <laughs> the coffee's in the back and the toilets are at the front. 